Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Maria Fernanda Bosmoski, and I'm Deputy Director of the Adrian Arsh Center for Latin America. Welcome to our event today, Guatemala's Choice, a conversation with presidential candidate Sandra Torres. For those of you tuning in over our social networks, I would like to remind you we have simultaneous interpretation. The conversation in this room will be held in Spanish. In less than a month, Guatemalans will return to the polls to decide on the future of their country. Sandra Torres of the party Unidad Nacional de la Esperanza, UNE, is one of the two contenders in this crucial election. She began her political career in 2003 as founder of the UNI party. Previously, <coughs> she was first lady between 2008 and 2011. In her professional career before entering politics, she was an investor, executive and businesswoman where she ran textile production companies and worked at the management level of several maquiladoras and industrial firms. As a veteran politician and former First Lady, Ms. Torres has extensive experience in Guatemalan politics. Her candidacy in the 2023 presidential elections marks the third time she has run for the office. <coughs> now, over the next 30 minutes, we will discuss the main issues of this election and Ms. Torres's proposals to address Guatemala's political and economic challenges. I wish to remind our audience, both online and in person, that yesterday we also spoke with Semilla candidate Bernardo Arrevalo, and I invite you to watch that interview as well. At the Center for Latin America, we're devoted to building bridges between the U.S. and the region and to highlight the importance of Latin American countries in solving global problems. Guatemala is no exception, and that is why it has been a priority for us to welcome and chat with both candidates. Once again, welcome, Ms. Torres. I will now turn the floor over to our center senior director, Jason Marzak. Thank you, Maria Fernanda. Welcome back to all those joining us, both in person and over social media. I'm delighted to be able to have this discussion with you, Ms. Torres, and to extend you a very welcome, warm welcome to the Atlantic Council. You're a presidential candidate in Guatemala representing the UNE party. And this public discussion will be an opportunity to delve into uh, Ms. Torres and the party's approaches in addressing the pressing challenges facing Guatemala, which is an important ally to the United States. We will discuss strategies for engaging different sectors and strategies for achieving meaningful change in the country and taking advantage of unique opportunities in the country. We have 30 minutes, so I wanted to get started with our first question. Ms. Torres, and these have been turbulent few weeks in, since the first round of voting in June. And there was a period of uncertainty and limbo in the country. The international community had its eyes fixed on Guatemala. You decided to pause your campaign. Could you discuss how you saw those days following the first round? Well, first and foremost, Good afternoon to everyone. I would first like to thank God for allowing us to be here. I would like to thank Atlantic Council for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of those who are here in person and those following us on social networks. I know that there are people watching us from Guatemala as well. First, I would like to introduce myself. I know you've already introduced me, but I think it's important for everyone to know that I am a presidential candidate. This is the third time I have run and for the presidency. I have been a businesswoman, but I have never been an elected official. The first round of elections in the country, I was fortunate to come in first thanks to 
the party structure of the party I represent. This is a party that has existed for 20 years. It, there were 30 political parties running in the first round, 23, 24 candidates in total. So that made the first round a bit complicated. And that's because I think people with so many political parties involved and so many candidates, I think there was some confusion. We want people to feel comfortable and in a position to choose their preferred candidate. And that's why a profound uh, electoral reform is necessary. And this is what I say to provide some context and background to this. In the first round of the most recent election, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal uh, had some found a lot of trouble in the systems, the electronic data systems. And a few days before that, I spoke out in public saying I was concerned that the central district had <clears throat> one system to transmit data that was independent of the the main system. It's called tra And we were concerned because we, our voters, come from rural areas. We won 17 out of 22 districts. We did not win the central district. So we were really struck by the fact that the central district had a different computer system. And we thought that was unnecessary. But it wasn't just that other political parties raised concerns about the process. In the surveys we did, and in the polls, and Mr. Arevalo did not appear to be a strong candidate. And, you know, that caused some doubts, and there was confusion, and the problems, and everyone knows what happened then. But I will now be running in the runoff. One of the major issues we faced was that the Supreme Electoral Council or Tribunal took too long to provide official results, to put their stamp on the official results. And so that led to even further confusion and questioning. When the final results were ultimately released, <coughs> the Movimiento Semilla, which was the opposing party, there were some legal issues and there were efforts to um, take away their charter. There were there were issues with uh, some of the signatures that they had gathered, among others. So that was the situation. Since the public prosecution ministry filed a legal action, then the question was, who's going to compete in the runoff? So I decided to pause the campaign because I wanted to know who the opposite party would be like a, a, a soccer game. You need to know who your opponent is. We wanted to find out what was going to happen. I wanted some clarity and I wanted to make sure I was playing by the rules and give them time to bring clarity to the situation. We want to be transparent. We want <clears throat> to play by the rules. So I then got started with the campaign again. Okay. So now with this soccer game, there are about three weeks until the runoff. Could you talk a bit about your agenda for the next three weeks? Particularly, what are some of the pressing issues that you and your party plan to focus on with a view toward the runoff? And just to wrap up my answer to your first question, Jason, is the runoff, there it's a 
45 day period but the supreme electoral tribunal just gave three weeks so there's very little time to campaign it's a much shorter period as far as my agenda is and that was your question right my agenda is to win the election i want to be the first woman president of guatemala i am 100 percent focused on our new strategies i'm visiting the provinces the departments knocking on doors visiting voters obtaining new voters the problem was these invalid ballots because that's the invalid ballots are purposely invalid ballots are the ones that won technically speaking this invalid vote i i should be running against that in the runoff that's what the data were saying but obviously that cannot be the case so what will be your strategies in the coming weeks talking about you've talked about visiting departments and provinces there are 23 districts in guatemala nationwide and so i am visiting those areas where i had a week showing and more in the urban areas and the urban vote so i'm just carrying out my campaign and saying who we are what we want for guatemala and making proposals in three very different areas. There's security that's very much concerning the populace. That's what the urban population is facing to a great degree. Employment and, and job creation is important and social protection. So here in the studio and social media, there are many people listening to us right now, listening to you. So thinking ahead to your plan, what's the plan for engaging all the different parties of civil society, the private sector and international organizations as well? And, and again, of course, public uh, private sector. Well, ours is a very participatory and inclusive party. We, in our strategy, want to strengthen our relations with the private sector because it is entrepreneurs, small, medium, and large, who will end up creating jobs. We need to talk to them. We need to provide them with legal certainty and public safety and clear rules to attract international investors because that will provide jobs to the young people of our country that are the majority of our population. What really gets me most is the young people. Most of the people emigrating to the U.S. are young people. Every day, 1,400 young people go to the U.S. looking for jobs. In some meetings, we've been talking about uh, temporary visas for young people. Canada is doing that too. And I want to have stronger ties with the U.S. so that our young people can go there, come here legally with a visa program where they can get training and have opportunities access to technology because there's so much talent in guatemala jason that's why we're focusing on young people and that's why having such a strategy is vital for our country and our international ties need to focus on that we want good relations with the us with taiwan with israel with the Ukraine, of course. We have a working group focused on Latin America, Central America specifically here at the center. We've got a number of members of that working group here joining us. And so that group's very interested in accelerating investment in Guatemala. Now, the U.S. is a very important partner. Of course, we're here in Washington right now. How do you foresee the role of the United States and environmental or economic development for Guatemala, this is 
Uh, very important. And, and another topic that we look at a lot here at the Atlantic Council near, near Shoring, how do you see the role of the United States in these areas, particularly with regard to economic development? Well, it's very strategic. Of course, the U.S. is our best part partner. 40% of our exports go to the U.S. We have more than 3 million Guatemalans living here in the U.S., $19 billion in remittances that flow into our economy every year. And so obviously it's very important for our country to strengthen ties with the U.S., especially given what you just mentioned or what we just mentioned, the temporary visa program, which of course makes things more attractive and, and all the more reason to have a strong relationship. We want to have closer toys with this country for the purpose of greater opportunities. And within Guatemala, we have to strengthen the legal framework to attract investors from the U.S. so that they'll come and invest in Guatemala. That's why the legislative agenda includes uh, passing a nearshoring law to attract those investments into Guatemala and to create the conditions necessary for investors to come to Guatemala and stay there. They need the tax incentives. That's vital to get the investments, and that's what we want. We want a good relationship with the private sector within and outside Guatemala, particularly with countries like the U.S. and, as I said before, Israel, Taiwan. So speaking of Taiwan, that's always a, an important subject here in Washington. How do you foresee the evolution of diplomatic relations between Guatemala and Taiwan? And are you anticipating any changes in that relationship? Or will it continue as now? Well, recall that Guatemala is the only country in Central America that so has diplomatic relations with Taiwan. We believe that we need to continue to strengthen our relationship with Taiwan, which has been a good ally, a good partner, has provided support, has helped our government in social arena, health, housing, uh, even loans. It has bolstered economic development infrastructure. One of the key highways in Guatemala has been built by Taiwan, so we want to continue our relationship with Taiwan. Uh, Guatemala is the only Central American country left. All the other countries have ties with mainland China, but in our agenda of diplomatic ties, we really have as key players, Taiwan, U.S., Israel, Ukraine, and of course the rest of Central America, our neighbors. We have four neighbors on our borders and we want to strengthen relationships within the region. That's a market of 40 million people. We want more open borders for goods to have that integration within Central America. So one issue that's been important to the U.S. has been the issue of corruption. I wonder if you could go into more details as to what your plan would be to combat corruption in the country. That is a cross-cutting commitment for us. Not only combating corruption, but also working with transparency. And this calls for adopting a series of laws that would generate this very necessary transparency in budget execution. For instance, we need to get rid of discretionality in spending. There are many people involved in corrupt acts. We need to be really drastic. This is a priority for me. That's something that I will tackle day one, God willing, if I become president. In addition, we want to ensure transparency through uh, e-government, 
open processes, accountability, social audits. All of this is very important. That's part of an integrated approach to providing Guatemala with the transparency it needs. Going back to the runoff a few days ago, the uh, Brian Nichols of the U.S. State Department and others in the international community have put out statements calling for respect for the electoral process in Guatemala. What is your message to the international community and, and your message here to the Washington community ahead of the August 20 runoff election to address the concerns that the international community has? Well, I'd like to share that on, honestly, there, um, there are official periods. August 20 was set by the tribunal. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal has determined that UNE and Semilla would be the two parties. So everything's very clear. I don't see a problem. But if the other party has legal issues that needs to be separated from the electoral process and their situation has to be clarified, uh, the issue of false um, signatures or dead people voting, all of that needs to be addressed because nobody's above the law. That's clear when you're wanting to govern. We have to show that we all respect the rule of law and the law of the land, and all parties need to set the example. So we are waiting for that clarification of the 5,000 signatures. I think that's important for the international community. As I said before, I paused my campaign, but now the runoff is upon us, August 20th, J January 14th of 2024 is when somebody new comes into office. I wanted to talk about the Congress in Guatemala because it will be vital in moving ahead with the priorities of the president, of course. So what would your strategy be to set the stage within the Congress and to work with the legislative branch, considering that you would not have the majority of seats in the contra Congress, what would your strategy be on that front? Well, right now there are 19 political parties represented in Congress. That's where all political forces converge. And this is true of all countries. What makes Guatemala different is the number of parties, and that's because our law allows that. We gain 28 seats. We have 28 seats. That's the second largest number after the 49 that the ruling party has. We have 28, and Semilla is in third place with 24. So everything's very fragmented in terms of legislative power uh, across 15 different parties. So we'll have to reach agreements, but not under the table. They have to be open and transparent. But we can't just oppose things to oppose or for opposition's sake. We have to be a constructive and not a destructive opposition. That is not how things work. And a lot has been achieved uh, through legislative agreements, um, but not agreements that are corrupt. Some political parties like uh, Semilla have said that reaching agreements with the ruling party was somehow questionable. But any politically mature party or person understands, and, and Mr. Arevalo is a deputy in the Congress, he knows that you have to reach agreements to do legislative work. You need 82 votes for regular laws. You need 107, uh, two-thirds majority for certain types of legislation. So 
greater efforts have to be made. And it's very similar to what happens here in Congress and in Congresses throughout the world. Yes, that's how democracy works. Exactly. So we're here at the Atlantic Council, a global organization with regional centers. We cover the whole world. So what's your message to the international community regarding the importance of the electoral process in Guatemala? Why is it why should it be important to the international community? Well, above all, what's important is respecting the will of the people. You had millions of people flock to the polls in June. I don't know how many will turn out in August but we're thinking between four and five million people. So the results need to be respected. And what has to be ensured above all is transparent, fair elections. And we recognize that the international community, well, first of all, we thank the community for their support and being international observers. And I, I do want to go back to the electronic data transmission issues. We are concerned because we saw the issues that came up in the first round. We don't want to see that in the runoff. We don't want electoral fraud. We want respect for the will of the people because as a political party, we are going to defend our votes. Okay, we've come to the end of our time. But I was wondering if you could extend a final message for those who are tuning in online and for those who are here in the, in the studio. <clears throat> Looking forward to the runoff, your final message, some of your ideas of how you'll govern should you be elected. Thank you to the Atlantic Council for this opportunity. My message is to all of those who are both here and those who are joining us on the social networks, my compatriots in Guatemala, as well as those who live here in the United States. I wanted to recognize and acknowledge the Guatemalan people. I ran into some Guatemalans at the airport, and it's clear that Guatemala is a magical country. We have so much to give. I am very committed to my country. I was raised to serve God and to serve my nation. And I believe this is the opportunity to demonstrate that we women can and know what we do. I want to have the opportunity to show the love and passion I have for my country and what I want as a Guatemalan to give back to Guatemalan commitment to prosperity, competitiveness, and employment and jobs for young people and a social safety net for six out of every 10 Guatemalans who live in poverty. Thank you so much, Ms. Torres, for joining us here at Atlantic Council headquarters here in Washington. I, these are some very busy days here in Washington. Thank you for your time. And thank, I wanted to reinforce the message that for Atlantic Council and the Adrian Arsh Center for Latin America, we're very, in devoted to fundamental respect for democracy and electoral processes in Guatemala. Thank you once again to you and thank you to those who joined us today. And I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you.